Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar on hand sanitizers, alcohols, COVID-19, and Shimazu's analytical solutions directed towards the fight against the novel coronavirus. We are excited to discuss with you the techniques that we are working with for the hand sanitizer and disinfectant market, as well as PCR virus test kits that are being used on the front lines to diagnose COVID-19. We will also discuss a unique training and accreditation program that will establish proficiency of scientists and laboratories in the ethanol industry. We have a variety of experts here to discuss our topics today and to field questions at the end. My name is Andy Fernando, and I'm the Marketing Manager for Energy and Chemicals at Shimazu Scientific Instruments. I'm joined by my colleague Yuan Lin, our Product Coordinator for Gas Chromatography, Sadir Dahal, Product Manager for Molecular Spectroscopy, and Jeremy Post, Senior Product Specialist for our Biotechnology Group. Also, we are joined by Professor Dr. Bob Dixon at the Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, who is also affiliated with the National Corn to Ethanol Research Center, or NSERC. This is a general outline of the webinar that we are presenting today. We aim to discuss the hand sanitizer market, including the alcohols that comprise them, the current regulatory environment, as well as concerns for the purity of these products and the analytical techniques that help laboratories ensure that their product is safe for use. We will also discuss a bit about how Shimazu has been on the front lines with PCR test kits that are being used globally for the detection and diagnosis of individuals infected with COVID-19. Lastly, our collaborators at the National Corn to Ethanol Research Center, or NSERC, at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville will discuss their badge accreditation program. We will wrap up with an opportunity for questions and discussion with the presenters. As a housekeeping note to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time during the webcast, and we will address them at the very end. Hand sanitizers have long been promoted for topical use to kill or inhibit the growth of viruses, bacteria, and fungi. As a note, washing hands with soap and water is the best defense against skin-borne pathogens, but alcohol-based hand sanitizers are nearly as effective when used properly. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, use of hand sanitizers has increased dramatically with consumers acutely aware of their own health and hygiene. There are two common hand sanitizer formulations, alcohol-based and alcohol-free. In the alcohol-based hand sanitizers, recommended alcohols include ethanol and isopropanol, whereas those that are alcohol-free often have components such as benzalkonium chloride, triclosan, or quaternary ammonium salts. Hand sanitizers with at least 60% ethanol or isopropanol by volume are recommended and are the most effective for COVID-19, among other viruses and bacteria. They function by denaturing proteins within the viruses and bacteria, rendering them harmless and unable to reproduce. As a direct result of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, hand sanitizer usage has surged. Market research shows relatively flat growth within the market in the years preceding 2020, but market growth from 2020 onwards as consumers are concerned for their health and are seeking ways to mitigate the spread of this disease. Early during the pandemic, you may have noticed so-called panic buying, which left shelves devoid of common household disinfectants, including alcohols, hand sanitizers, bleach, among others. As an anecdotal observation, it's only been in the past four weeks or so that I've been able to regularly find hand sanitizers at my local stores, and demand for them seems to remain high. Because of this high demand and relaxed regulations from the Food and Drug Administration, many alcohol-producing companies diverted assets to the production of hand sanitizers or alcohol for the use in hand sanitizers. This includes manufacturers of beverage alcohol, such as breweries and distilleries, fuel ethanol producers, and industrial chemical manufacturers. Hand sanitizers are relatively simple to produce with the most basic consisting of nothing more than alcohol and water. Other ingredients may include a gelling agent such as aloe vera or glycerin, hydrogen peroxide to kill spores within the ingredients themselves, and optional scents and colorants that make the product more pleasing to use. A major concern for alcohol and hand sanitizer manufacturers is the uncertain regulatory environment in the United States. Hand sanitizers are considered over-the-counter drugs and are regulated by the FDA. Ethanol and isopropanol used in hand sanitizers must be USP or FCC grade for use or, at the minimum, comply with new chemical regulation to be acceptable for hand sanitizer use. The FDA has published a number of regularly updated documents to assist alcohol producers ensure the safety of their product. These can be found freely available on the FDA's website and we will discuss them as we go on through this webinar. 
In short, the new recent regulations have established chemistry restrictions such that fuel and industrial grade ethanol producers may use their product and hand sanitizers provided that they determine that the alcohol does not exceed regulatory concentration limits of common contaminants such as methanol, benzene, acetaldehyde, and acetal, among others. The primary concerns that laboratories are expressing are uncertainty with wading into the FDA's regulatory structure. And fortunately, because of the relaxed regulations, it seems that the most stringent rules are being loosened for now, and it is comparatively easy for laboratories to ensure compliance. As of now, there are indications that some, if not all of these relaxed regulations will expire at the end of the 2020 calendar year. However, it is not entirely certain which aspects of the regulatory structure will be changed. Here at Shimantu, we will keep apprised of these changes with the FDA and act accordingly to ensure that your laboratory remains compliant with any new regulations that come down the road. The most immediate concerns with ethanol and isopropanol for hand sanitizers is contamination, particularly with methanol, but other compounds are of concern as well, such as 1-propanol. These compounds may be hazardous to the user when it's applied to their skin. In fact, there have been a number of cases of methanol-contaminated hand sanitizers that could be dangerous to use. And as of early October 2020, the FDA's list of hand sanitizers to avoid included over 200 products. All in all, the main purpose of chemical analysis of alcohols and hand sanitizers is to determine the alcohol content and to assess for contamination. We mentioned earlier that products ought to be at least 60% alcohol by volume to ensure their effectiveness. And similarly, there is potential for contamination by other compounds that could be harmful when used topically. We will discuss the three main types of instrumentation that are being used for analysis. Gas chromatography for alcohol concentration and assessment of volatile contaminants. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy for ethanol and IPA concentration. And UV-Vis spectroscopy for nonspecific screening of contaminants and discoloration. With all of these techniques available, we have created this flowchart that assists laboratories in determining which method is best for their needs. Again, to overview the presentation moving forward, we will cover these techniques and assays, Shimazu's COVID testing kits for diagnosis of the disease, and end by discussing SIUE's ethanol laboratory training program. I would now like to pass the presentation over to my colleague, Yuan Lin, who will discuss analysis of alcohols and hand sanitizers by gas chromatography. Thank you, Andy. In the next few slides, I'll discuss the usage of gas chromatographs and the quality control of hand sanitizer products. The configuration is quite simple. Uh, just a standard GC with an FID detector. Shown here is our Shimatsu GC2030, the newest GC model equipped with modern features such as large touchscreen display, proprietary click tag fittings, and gas saving technology. And it's suitable for both volatile impurity analysis and alcohol content determination. Direct liquid injection is commonly used for impurity or alcohol content analysis. Using a split injector, excess samples can be vented out upon injection to avoid overloading the column, the so-called dilute and shoot technique. Depending on the sample though, manual dilution prior to sample analysis might still be necessary. And if your sample contains non-volatile substances that could gum up the inlet, S-based sampling technique could be used instead of direct injection to avoid frequent cleaning and maintenance of your GC system. As mentioned earlier, GC is great for trace impurity analysis in material used to make hand sanitizers, such as ethanol, isopropanol, and glycerin. And there are US USP monographs describing the requirements for purity of these ingredients. For ethanol impurities, the USP requires that the first two eluding peaks, acetaldehyde and, and methanol, has a resolution larger than 1.5. As shown in the chromatogram here, the average resolution for the three replicates is 1.68 per USP resolution, complying with the regulation requirements. Another USP requirement for ethanol impurity is that the benzene maximum level could not exceed 2 ppm volume by volume. Therefore, the GC system must be able to detect benzene at this low concentration. As shown in the chromatogram here, that is 
doable on a GC FID system. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, because of the high demand, many companies have diverted their assets to producing alcohol for using hand sanitizers, including breweries and distilleries and few ethanol producers. And the purity of these ethanol may not necessarily meet the USP criteria. Now, FDA has established different criteria for impurities in hand sanitizers. Nevertheless, the max level of 2 ppm benzene has remained unchanged. I'd like to point out, though, that the FDA guidance uses a different unit for their concentration measurement from USP. While well, both have, uh, can be referred to as ppm, FDA concentration are ppm weight over weight, while USP is ppm volume over volume. So the concentrations can actually be slightly different depending on the density of the compounds in the matrix. We have noticed that a set of standards made by Bion companies has gained popularity for calibrating GCs for impurity analysis. These standards contain 20 commonly found volatile impurities dissolved in ethanol matrix and could save company a lot of time trying to make their own. Of this list of 20 impurities, the red colored ones here are four original contaminants from USP monograph and also the level one impurities for FDA guidance. The blue colored ones are the level two impurities from FDA guidance. The ones that are not highlighted are extra impurity compounds in this uh, mix. Remember, there is a criteria in USP monograph that says all other impurities added together should be no more than 300 ppm. So these are still relevant. One thing to notice is that acetone, which is also a level two impurity, is not included in this mix. As shown here, all 20 compounds can be separated successfully on GC with FID. Acetone, although not included here, eludes before ethylpropanol on the tail of ethanol and can be separated and quantified as well. Now we switch gear and talk about alcohol content determination, aka how much ethanol or isopropanol is in my hand sanitizer. This analysis can be done using packed or capillary column. And we tested both helium and nitrogen carrier gas due to the rising cost of helium. Shown on the left is the assay of ethanol content following USP611 methodology using helium as carrier gas and acetonitrile as the internal standard. On the right is an assay using nitrogen carrier gas and a modified method, measuring both ethanol and isonol, isopropanol content in hand sanitizer. In our modified method, butanol was used as internal standard because acetyl nitrile eludes fairly close to IPA under these conditions and may interfere with its quantification. Both carrier gas work quite well, but of course nitrogen is a lot cheaper. So if you do not need to strictly follow USB 611 methodology, you could consider using nitrogen carrier gas instead to save cost. While GCs can be used for alcohol content determination, due to the high concentration of alcohol used in hand sanitizers, some dilution of the sample is generally necessary to do this analysis by GC. FTIR, in many cases, will be a better choice uh, due to simpler sample prep. I will now pass the presentation to my colleague, Sudhir Dahao, who will discuss hand sanitizer analysis by FTRR and uv spectroscopy. Thank you for that introduction. Commonly used alcohols like ethanol and isopropyl alcohol are being used as active ingredients in around 97% of all over-the-counter hand sanitizers in the world today. CDC has determined that the concentration of these active ingredients in the hand sanitizers must be between 60 to 95 percent for them to be generally effective. The FDA has been constantly evaluating these standards to ensure safety and efficiency of such hand sanitizers. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, or commonly known as FDIR, has proven to be an excellent tool for quick 
but very accurate determination of active ingredients in hand sanitizers. In addition, there is no sample prep involved and minimum use of consumable and ease of use makes analysis very fast. Sample measurement is also very easy. And as seen in the picture on the right, it simply requires dropping a droplet of sample on the sampling crystal. Each sample is measured in under a minute. Here we have a couple of examples to show how easy it is to measure and understand measurements obtained from FDIR. The left graph shows the infrared spectra of two brands of hand sanitizers, brand A and brand B, a spectrum from 60% ethanol standard and a spectrum of 80% ethanol standard. As it can be seen here, comparing the concentration of ethanol in hand sanitizers is very easy by quickly getting few FTIR measurements. In this example, both brand A and brand B show concentrations of ethanol between 60% and 80%. More accurate numerical concentration determination can be done by simply creating a calibration curve using various concentration standards. Similarly, the graph on the right compares spectral differences between 60% and 80% isopropyl alcohol, or IPA, with two other brands of hand sanitizers containing IPA as their active ingredient. The application note on this topic is available from Shimazu with the title, Quick and Easy Analysis of Alcohol Content in Hand Sanitizer by FDIR Spectroscopy. It can be downloaded from resources section of this webinar. In addition, a flyer on this topic is also available for download. We recommend the use of our compact FDIR spectrophotometer, the IR Spirit T for the analysis. The compact design makes it extremely versatile to use in traditional laboratories or in mobile field laboratories. A result of advanced engineering, this unit packs the same features and capabilities of standard size benchtop units and fully complies with requirements set by pharmacopoeias and regulatory agencies. It is designed to accommodate attenuated total reflectance or ATR accessories which enables rapid measurements. With the ATR, as mentioned earlier, there is no sample prep and a droplet of sample is all that is needed to carry out measurements. In addition, cleaning between samples is very easy as Kim wipe or similar cleaning material can be used to wipe away the samples. Therefore, IR Spirit T with an ATR is an excellent tool for alcohol content determination because of its accuracy, speed, simplicity, and low cost. Now changing gears, let's go over the determination of impurities, clarity, and color testing using ultraviolet visible spectroscopy. The US Pharmacopoeia, European Pharmacopoeia, and Japanese pharmacopoeia all describe the measurement of impurities in alcohol using UV visible absorbance spectroscopy. In addition, clarity is the determination of amount of light transmitted through a substance. And impurities or adulteration can be determined by simply comparing the sample's UV visible spectrum with standards UV visible spectrum. Finally, UV visible spectroscopy also helps determine if there were leaching from the container or adulteration by analyzing the color of the sample. In some cases, the change in color can be very subtle and may not be apparent to our eyes, but spectroscopy determination like this is very effective and catching a problem like this at source can prevent huge potential damages. The graph on the right shows two UV vis absorbance spectra. Red is a typical spectrum of pure ethanol, and blue is of a sample that was analyzed. Even a quick visual comparison between these two is enough to show that there is a contaminant in the sample. The application note on this topic is available from Shimazu with the title, 
measurement of impurities in ethanol using UV-vis spectrophotometer. And it goes over the technique in details. It can be downloaded from the resources section of this webinar. UV-vis spectroscopy allows for quick definitive tests for colors in alcohol. The Simazo analysis software allows plotting the color of a sample using various standard color scales. For quality control tests, pass-fail judgment in the software can be set. This way, as soon as the spectrum is measured, the color analysis is carried out and pass-fail determination is done within seconds. As mentioned earlier, this is very powerful test because it can also determine subtle changes in color, otherwise not visible to our eyes. For determination of impurities, clarity, and color, we recommend using the UV1900i UVV spectrophotometer from Shimazu. It is an excellent workhorse instrument that complies with requirements from US, European, Japanese, and Chinese pharmacopoeias. It is a very easy to use spectrophotometer and can be operated from PC using the supplied software or as a standalone instrument using the large interactive touch panel. And as described earlier, simple pass fail judgments can be enabled for many types of determination, including absorbance, clarity, and color. With this, we conclude the spectroscopy section for hand sanitizer analysis. I hope you found the presentation on both FTIR and UVBIS sections helpful. I'll be available for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. But now I'll hand over to our moderator, Andrew Bernadel. Thank you very much, Sudhir, for that portion of the presentation. We're going to switch it up now and kind of switch gears. I'm going to kick it over to my colleague, Jeremy Post, who will discuss Shimazu's RT-PCR testing kits for COVID-19 diagnosis that we have been deploying into the field and using in the United States and globally. And then we'll be joined by our collaborator, Professor Bob Dixon of Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, who will discuss their new badge accreditation program for the ethanol laboratory industry and its employees. Thanks, Andy. To begin, I'll provide a brief background about SARS-CoV-2 and diagnostic testing. SARS-CoV-2 was initially tentatively named 2019 novel coronavirus. Subsequently, the International Committee of Taxonomy of Viruses named the virus SARS-CoV-2. COVID-19 is the name of the illness caused by SARS-CoV-2. The virus is an enveloped, positive sense, single-stranded ribonucleic acid virus with a 30 kilobase genome. The virus has an RNA proofreading mechanism keeping the mutation rate relatively low. The genome encodes for non-structural proteins, four structural proteins, including spike, S, envelope, E, membrane, M, nucleocapsid, N, and accessory proteins. For cell entry, the virus binds to a cell surface ACE2 receptor, that is, an angiotensin converting enzyme 2. SARS-CoV-2 is the seventh coronavirus identified that is known to infect humans. Four of these viruses are endemic, seasonal, and tend to cause mild respiratory disease. The other two viruses are the more virulent zoonotic Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, or MERS, and Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, type 1, or SARS. Diagnostic testing can involve detecting the virus itself, either viral RNA or antigen, or detecting the human immune response to infection, such as antibodies. Standard confirmation of acute SARS-CoV-2 infections is based on the detection of unique viral sequences by nucleic acid amplification tests, such as real-time 
reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, or RT-PCR, the assay's targets include regions on the E, RDRP, N, and S genes. The process of selecting target sequences for diagnostic assays capable of high sensitivity and selectivity, but also robustness against genetic mutations which would cause loss of function for the assay is an expansive endeavor. The virus may be detectable in the upper respiratory tract one to three days before onset of symptoms. SARS-CoV-2 can be detected in a wide range of other body fluids and compartments, but it is most frequently detected in respiratory material and therefore respiratory samples remain the sample type of choice for diagnostics. To address diagnostic kit parameters initially indicated by US FDA and CDC in March of 2020, Shimazu created a RT-PCR diagnostic reagent kit around the N1 and N2 viral genome targets and the RNASP internal control. This is the 2019 novel coronavirus detection kit. Each kit supports tests for 100 patient samples and controls. There are many technological benefits engineered into these four small vials. Let's compare workflows to demonstrate. The diagnostic testing process begins and ends the same way between the conventional and Shimazu AmpDirect workflows. The same upper respiratory patient sample swab types and viral transport media are collected on the front end, and the same RT-PCR instruments for data acquisition, data analysis, and reporting are used on the back end. Importantly, the workflows differ in the amount of time, effort, and reagents required to prepare the samples for RT-PCR and in the number of samples which can be tested in each batch run on the RT-PCR. The purpose of the RNA extraction and purification steps, indicated in red, is to take a relatively large volume of each patient sample viral transport medium to collect a sufficient number of virus particles transferred by the swab lyse the viral protein coat to release the RNA into solution, capture the RNA onto a stationary phase, wash and rinse the RNA, and elude it into a clean and simplified buffer suitable for RT-PCR analysis. This is a lengthy, labor-intensive process which runs the risks of errors. Further, this process requires an additional set of reagents and consumables separate from the conventional RT-PCR kit, which during this pandemic have been in short and irregular supply. For many labs, limited access to and utilization of these extraction reagents has been a root cause for extended turnaround times to provide results to patients. Once extracted, some conventional kits require individual single plex tests for each gene target and internal control, meaning two, three, or more individual tests must be run per patient sample. This process reduces the number of patients which can be tested in one batch of samples, increases the time to results, increases cost per analysis, and adds additional strain on the consumables supply chain. Conversely, the Shimazu AMP Direct reagents make it possible for lab technicians to take a small volume of viral transport medium and begin immediately processing it for PCR. The separate RNA extraction protocol is not required. The sample treatment reagent lyses the virus particles and blocks the components of this complex human and VTM matrix, which would otherwise inhibit the reverse transcription, and polymerase chain reaction enzymatic processes. 
This greatly simplifies and expedites the sample preparation effort and time. It also removes the hurdle of reliance upon unavailable reagents and reduces waste. While this sample prep also saves time, this AMP Direct workflow is further expedited by being a multiplex test, which analyzes the N1, N2, and RNAsP genes all in one PCR well, each target having a distinct probe, which maintains selectivity and robust performance while increasing the number of patient samples included per batch. This overview of the protocol demonstrates its simplicity. The process spans three parts, beginning with the use of five microliters of viral transport medium mixed with five microliters of the sample treatment reagent. This solution is mixed and heated at 90 degrees C for five minutes and cooled while awaiting addition of the RT-PCR reaction solution. The second part occurs during the heating step, which is the creation of the RT-PCR reaction solution. And that's done simply by mixing reagents A, B, and C together at the appropriate volumes. Part three is the addition of 15 microliters of RT-PCR reaction solution to the prepared samples, which are now ready for data acquisition by RT-PCR. The thermal cycling parameters for two widely used RT-PCR platforms are provided here. These RT-PCR amplification plots indicate whether the internal control and viral RNA targets were present at sufficient level and with sufficient integrity within the patient sample to be detected. Importantly, each gene has a discrete probe which fluoresces at unique wavelengths, providing simultaneous responses for each target during each cycle, which are plotted as shown here. To conclude this brief overview, I'd like to review four features of the Shimazu AMP Direct 2019 novel coronavirus detection kit. First, the protocol is simple. Not needing RNA extraction saves time, effort, and cost. Using only four reagents, you go from VTM to RT-PCR to results with an easy three-part protocol. These are tremendous multifaceted benefits to labs. Second, this multiplex kit saves reagents, consumables, time, and increases sample throughput. Third, the multiplex assay incorporates individual probes for each target gene, which improves accuracy in interpreting results. And fourth, all of this capability is provided without sacrificing the sensitivity needed to detect weak responders, which can be collected in a variety of VTM formulations and collection volumes. The limit of detection is sub seven copies per reaction, which is directly comparable to some and better than many extraction-based diagnostic tests. Lastly, I'd like to introduce Professor Bob Dixon from NSERC to discuss their badge accreditation program. Thank you for the introduction, Jeremy. I would like to talk to you about a new laboratory technician training programs that we are working on at SIUE, that we just received $1.57 million from the U.S. Department of Labor for their COVID-19 pandemic employment recovery program. We have been funded to take 100 displaced workers through a series of industrial lined credential badges, ultimately producing 100 new chemical technician, quality assurance technician, and food technician um, graduates. You might be wondering, what is a digital badge? A digital badge is an evidence-based portable credential demonstrating an earner's proficiency in a specific competency or skills. 
Digital badges enhances individuals' employment competitiveness by highlighting and defining the students' abilities relative to in-demand skills in their field, and that this will contribute to the employer's overall ability to thrive and adapt in the changing workforce. Badges are signals to employers that a candidate possesses the critical skills or competencies necessary for the entry-level positions or to advance within an organization. We also anticipate that these badges and industrial line credentials are just the starting point for the student's lifelong career and advancement in your company and into associate and bachelor's degrees. Using MZ, which is a labor market analytics firm that collects and integrates complex labor market data and builds user-friendly tools to help you understand employment and training needs for a region, this slide shows that there are very often discrepancies between what employers want in hires as found in the job descriptions to what is found in the workforce competencies for the hires. Using MC, you can view what basic and specialized skills that are required of hires in your industry. This data came from jobs nationally in the ethanol industry over the last year. With the information from the previous slide and the fact that most entry-level laboratory technicians now are required to have hands-on skills and proficiency on instrumentation far beyond most current community college training programs, we have developed chemical technician, quality assurance, and food science technician training programs to meet this obvious gap in employers' needs and the workforce competencies. You can see that these programs have a common core. One is the background chemistry, bi biological, and mathematic competencies that we will ensure the students have prior to entering the laboratory safety competencies and the general laboratory technique competencies. Then, depending on the industrial line credential, they will move into badges specific for the individual credential. These credentials and badges were specifically designed to be implemented during the COVID pandemic and what we foresee in the next years, as well as the ability for this program to be housed locally and then individually have hands-on trainings at other locations nationally. The program involves the first, the pre-selection, where the, the participants are chosen based on a test known as the TABE test, which uh, is a general mathematics exam, uh, that this will be done by our local workforce partners. And then we will start the students into background uh, online training uh, that involves uh, the sciences uh, and as well as other competencies as needed. Um, a lot of this information is uh, housed within Joe videos, as well as the Khan Academy, uh, as well as um, various other sources that will help make sure that all participants have a basic understanding of math, biology, and chemistry. Once all of the students are found competent in the basic science and math, they will then start their individual badging on various topics from safety through um, chemistry lab experiences. Here we have an example of the students going through the Joe vid video modules on pipetting. And the students will um, go through the Joe videos and at which point they will be assessed as to whether or not they are competent on the basic understanding of pipetting uh, at which point they will then move on to the next phase. Once they have completed the online com Jove component, they will then have various pieces of equipment uh, delivered to them at home such that they can practice the uh, techniques, instrumentation, and equipment um, at home. We envision sending them pipettes 
so that they can practice the pipetting, various um, um, glassware where they can do volume and various other measurements, uh, pouring and using common laboratory uh, glassware, as well as the possibility of including experimentation at home using multi multiple techniques um, so that they can get some hands-on training uh, at their location. At the same time as they've received the pipettes or various other pieces of equipment at home, they will also start completing an asynchronous point of view recordings that have been done by faculty and graduate assistants at the university. Um, this will be in the point, uh, uh, point of view type mode where the graduate student or faculty member will take them through the detailed use of, in this case, pipettes, and then some of the pitfalls, some of the common errors or accidents that happen while using the pipette, and this will all be done as if they were actually doing it themselves. Once they have completed the competency for the asynchronous um, point of view training, they will then undergo synchronous point of view training, where the graduate student or faculty member will have the POV recording device and the student will stream into a session where they will physically tell the graduate student or faculty member how to use the piece of equipment or the experiment and they will go through a similar experience that they saw in the asynchronous point of view, but now this will be a synchronous training. The faculty member or graduate student will throw hiccups into the procedure. Maybe they will spill something and the student will have to then take the faculty member or graduate students through the process of how to clean up properly, how to calibrate the pipettes or various other techniques that are commonly used in pipetting. After the students have gone through all of the online training described before, for the first time they will actually come to campus and go through the training on each, uh, each piece of equipment or experiment with a one-on-one -on -one instructor that's either a faculty member or a graduate student in which they will actually do the hands-on use of the piece of equipment or the experiment for the first time. Once they have completed that competency, we will allow them to have free time so that they can further um, strengthen their skills in using of the piece of equipment or the experiment. And then after they have completed all of the training, we will then go through a assessment of all of their competencies on all the various techniques and equipment that they have been exposed to. Once they have completed that assessment successfully, we will provide them the opportunity to work on in our facilities on either research projects we are working on or contract analytical work that we are doing for our clients. And then after all of this, they will have successfully been awarded the credential. Once they have been successfully awarded the credentials, they are then ready to proceed into the industrial partnership or on-the-job training experience for our industrial clients that have signed up and uh, have positions available for these uh, students as they are awarded their um, competencies for the various technician programs that we are running. That pretty much sums up the program as we have it planned now. Um, I would really like to thank our Shamatsu partner uh, with us on this initiative, as well as all of the uh, attendees of today's webinar. And I really appreciate the time you've given me in order to tell you about this exciting program here at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. I will turn things back now over to Andy to wrap up the final comments. And when we, uh, when we open up for questions and discussions, I'll be glad to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you again for your time. I want to thank all of our presenters today for offering their expertise to this webinar. 
To wrap up, the market for hand sanitizers and alcohol to use in hand sanitizers is rapidly growing, mostly as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and increased interest in personal health and hygiene. It's critical that hand sanitizers and their ingredients be tested to ensure that their potency and purity align with the current FDA guidelines, which are currently in a relaxed state. It's uncertain if and when the requirements on chemistry will be rolled back to their previous levels, specifically for impurities. As we've discussed here, Shimandu offers a variety of analytical solutions that ensure that alcohol and hand sanitizers are safe for use. Shimandu is also engaged in the fight against COVID-19 by producing PCR-based test kits that are used for diagnosis of the disease. Daily diagnostic testing in the United States has increased drastically and at times has exceeded 1 million tests per day. Therefore, it is critical to have a steady supply chain of test kits so that testing is available, quick, and low cost. Lastly, the badge accreditation program through NSERC at SIUE is an excellent way to expand your knowledge and marketability within the ethanol industry and helps laboratories ensure consistent, high-quality results. I want to express my appreciation for your attendance at this webinar, and I would like to, again, thank all of our contributors to this discussion, and we will open up now for our question and answer portion. Okay, we'll get started with some Q&A. We got some good questions that came in throughout the webinar. So again, I appreciate everyone uh, attending and, and uh, offering some, some points of discussion. Our first question is uh, about molecular spectroscopy. And the question was whether or not we can estimate the ethanol content by UV viz uh, spectroscopy. And we'll turn it over to Sadir. Hi, uh, excellent question, by the way. Um, yeah, yes. Um, Using FDIR, you know, there are uh, certain areas in the spectrum of uh, methanol and ethanol that are that are unique to each, um, you know, each um, uh, sample or each, um, you know, methanol and ethanol. Um, and experiments can be co conducted where, you know, you can you can mix ratios of methanol to ethanol, and then you, you create a series of standards, and based on that, you can determine uh, how much uh, methanol could be on your samples. Uh, for example, um, you know, methanol has some uh, unique peaks right around um, uh, right around 10, 20 uh, wave numbers and about 11, 15 wave numbers. Similarly, ethanol has something around 10, 50 and 10, 90. So um, those are for pure substances. But when you mix, you know, it, it get it could get trickier. So it's best to do a series of mixtures and create your own. Um, um, Create your own data and then use that to, you know, com compare against your unknown to determine the, um, you know, uh, content of methanol. Fantastic, thank you. And then one follow-up to that. Um, so that was about ethanol on UV viz. The follow-up to that would be um, another question that came in of whether or not we can use FTIR to assess for contaminants such as methanol. So switching to FTIR now. Um, sorry about that. The answer <laughs> I answered is for FTIR earlier, but now answering on. So the UV viz, uh, UV viz is normally used to do a quick, uh, you know, quality control, quick check for impurities or you know any any foreign contaminants. So, um, and because it has bigger substance, they they show broad peaks. So it may not be able to you know get exact amount of uh, methanol or ethanol or any any impurities. But with UV viz, what you can do is you can quickly check um, any any contaminants. And if you know what your contaminants may be, in that case, yes, you can create calibration curve and even, you know, um, calculate exact values or concentration of both ethanol or your impurities in in your sample. Great, thank you, Sadir. We had a, a question uh, come in just about Shimadu in general, asking um, about the availability of, of service and technical support that Shimadu can offer, and uh, I'll, I'll answer that one just generally. Is that um, we have uh, 10 regional offices across the United States. Uh, we offer tech support and service in all 50 states. Um, but specific to the, uh, the ethanol industry, we have two regional offices in the Midwest, one in Kansas City and one in uh, Chicago that covers a lot of uh, ethanol country. And so we do have uh, tech support and service engineers um, kind of stationed throughout that area that would be able to uh, provide uh, expertise and service to your laboratory. The next question that came in uh, was about the badge program through SIUE, and the question was, we saw a lot about learning how to pipette, but the, we were wondering about which instruments uh, the candidates would be credential, credentialed or badged in. 
Yes, so thank you for the question. Professor Dick. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, it depends on which of the technician programs that they go through. Um, but as an example, in the uh, just the laboratory technician program, they will be badged on centrifuge, pH meters, auto titrators, balances, UV vis, IR, fluorescence, GC, HPLC, uh, mass spec, and fluorescence uh, and UV vis plate readers. Those are the major major pieces of instrumentation that the lower level badge laboratory technician would do. In terms of the upper level chemistry technician, that's going to include uh, various titrators. Uh, as well as microbiology, uh, hoods, as well as incubators. They, they'll learn all about microscopy, uh, uh, basically 2D, vis, uh, 2D electrophoresis. They'll do quantitative PCR. They will be trained on all of those various instruments and techniques associated with them. Fantastic. Thank you. Next question came in was about gas chromatography, and it says that we discussed it briefly, but we were wondering if you could describe more about the gas saver on the GC2030 and how it works to decrease gas usage. So we'll turn over to Yuan Lin, our GC expert, joining us. Oh, thank you, Andy. Um, regarding gas saving, so it has to do with uh, which carrier gas you use. Um, we all know helium costs a lot these days, so if you're using helium gas, most people will be a little more price sensitive. So there are a few tricks you could use. Uh, if you're doing a high split ratio, like what you would do for ethanol analysis, because the high content is likely to stay with a pretty high ratio, you can either switch to nitrogen carrier gas, as we pointed out earlier. Um, that's possible if you don't have to stick with uh, the standard USP method. Or um, you can use gas saving mode, which we offer our GCs that allow you to turn down a ratio once the injection has been made. Or you can uh, use uh, a gas switching device, such as our gas selector, uh, which allow you to switch to nitrogen gas once you complete your analysis. So these are a few tricks you could use to save on heat and usage if you can't use alternative carry gas. Great, thank you. Another question just came in about the, um, the SIUE NSERC badge program, and the question uh, broadly was, uh, what's the process to apply, and what's the cost uh, for the lab tech badges um, that are being offered? Uh, yes, right now the the U uh, I'm sorry the grant that we've received from the federal government for the 100 participants, uh, they have to be within a four-county region of where we are at now. Uh, however, we do plan to uh, accept other um, candidates for these positions um, at a cost of around $2,000 for each of the um, individual lab technician programs that we have going. In addition, we're very interested in partnering with individual companies so that they can pick and choose which of the badges they would like to incorporate uh, into their training, uh, that we might do that training for them at here so that they could go directly into the company uh, with the exact set of credentials that you need there. And that would be on a, a number of badge costs that could be discussed um, uh, with you um, in that regard. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we had a question come in about some of the methods and some of the data that we had presented. Um, I wanted to call attention to the audience that uh, as part of this webinar, we have attached a uh, ethanol laboratory or a hand sanitizer workbook that kind of is a compendium of the, um, the five or so methods that we've presented today. Uh, so you're free to download that as a PDF. It'll also be available on Shimazu's website where you can get some of the method details and parameters and uh, if you have specific questions, you're more than welcome to reach out um, for, for clarification. We have time for just a couple more questions. Um, this one came in about FCIR, and it's asking about the ATR stage and asking about whether or not the, the alcohols will evaporate uh, on the ATR stage prior to analysis and how that's overcome. 
Um, actually, that, that's a simple fix. We offer a volatile cover. It's, in a, it's a piece of uh, rubber, uh, almost like a rubber gasket that you would put on top of the sample. And then, you know, we have found that it is very effective. You know, it, it can retain the alcohol for minutes um, for analysis. So, yeah, that, that is easily overcome. Great. Sounds and looks easy to me. The uh, next question, again, among uh, molecular spectroscopy was uh, just uh, if we could uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on the color analysis uh, software and what the, you know, what the relevance of that is to, uh, to these sorts of uh, samples. Uh, sure. So color analysis is actually uh, you know, very powerful and uh, something, something relatable to really anybody, even somebody who has minimal background in science. Uh, for, to give you an example, uh, you know, we, we were working with a customer who, uh, who, has, uh, who thought that there were some impurities on, in an alcohol and then they were, they were looking for some, some colors and you know, in, in some, some samples the colors were actually visible to the eye and some they were not. So you know, at first they were thought that they did not have any impurities but then with a quick, quick UV test and color analysis we found out it, it had the same contaminant just in a uh, lower, with a lower concentration. So um, overall, color analysis looks into the you know uh, visible re region of the spectrum, and using uh, one of the several approved standard color scales gives you color values of your sample. Great. It looks like we have one last question on gas chromatography uh, came in, and. The question is that you show data uh, using helium and nitrogen carrier gas. Is it easy to switch between the two if we are interested in saving money on not using helium for carrier gas? Yeah, indeed. This is actually really easy. Um, using gas selector, you can do the switching in one batch, actually. You can just set different methods. Gas selector will automatically switch the gas for you um, and carry out any baseline stability testing and make sure your each method is run uh, by the uh, specific carrier gas that you specify. Okay, fantastic. Looks like there was uh, one last um, question or comment asking about um, whether or not we could um, distribute this presentation as, as uh, a PDF or slide. This presentation will be available on demand and we can uh, absolutely accommodate that request to anyone who, who wants the, uh, the content. Uh, we're happy to distribute that uh, as well. So we're going to wrap up with that. Um, I appreciate everyone's attendance and attention. Uh, if there's any other uh, questions or comments, you know, feel free to reach out to uh, anyone here at Shimazu, and uh, we appreciate you uh, for attending. Thank you very much.